Subject shows symptoms of an overdeveloped sense of vengeance. It's going to get him into trouble someday. Oh, hi there. In our last session, we tested our prediction that a man with Muhammad's childhood experiences would rebel against tradition and authority. Muhammad's father died before he was born. Shortly after his birth, he was sent to live with a foster family. When he was around four years old, he was taken away from the foster family and returned to his mother. His mother died when he was six, and custody then fell to his grandfather, who died when he was eight. Children who experience so many broken relationships so early in life tend to rebel against authority and tradition. So we took a closer look at Muhammad's life to see if he fits the pattern. And we found that Muhammad fits the pattern more perfectly than anyone else in history because it's impossible to rebel against authority and tradition more than Muhammad did. The Prophet of Islam attacked his own people theologically, socially, morally, economically, and militarily, and he violently subjugated his own tribe and his own city. So this prediction wasn't just confirmed, it was completely confirmed. But we also predicted that Muhammad's childhood experiences would breed a kind of hostility towards father figures, especially towards the concept of God as a heavenly father, and that Muhammad would have difficulties forming normal relationships with other people. Let's test our second prediction by examining the impact Muhammad's broken relationships had on his view of father figures, and most importantly, on his view of God. There's some intriguing evidence of Muhammad's hostility towards father figures in the Muslim sources. For instance, in the Quran, we read numerous stories about Mary, the mother of Jesus. We know where these stories came from. Muhammad plagiarized stories that were circulating in Arabia. His contemporaries knew this and repeatedly accused him of plagiarism. Hence, we read in the Quran, Surah 6, verse 25, when they come to you, Muhammad, disputing with you, those who disbelieve say, This is nothing but fables of the ancients. Surah 8, verse 31. And when our verses are recited to them, they say, We have heard this before. If we wished, we could certainly say the like of it. This is nothing but mere tales of the ancients. Surah 16, verse 24. And when it is said to them, What has your Lord revealed to Muhammad? They say mere fables of the men of old. What's most interesting for our purposes is that when Muhammad was plagiarizing stories about Mary, he removed Joseph from the stories. In the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, for example, Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus are under a palm tree. Mary is thirsty and hungry, but there's no water, and the fruit on the palm tree is too high. But the baby Jesus miraculously speaks, a spring of water miraculously appears, and the palm tree miraculously bends down. If you've read the Quran, this should sound familiar, since the story became part of Surah 19. But there's something missing from Muhammad's version. Joseph. Joseph is nowhere to be found. Why would Muhammad plagiarize a story and then remove the only father figure, in the story. Apparently, Muhammad preferred to think of Mary as a single mother, just like his own mother. It's no coincidence that the greatest man in the Quran, Jesus, the one who is born of a virgin, who lives the most miraculous life in history, who's identified as the Messiah, who's rescued from death, and who will return to judge the world, is the man with a mother, but absolutely no father. So there are some interesting features of the Quran that confirm Muhammad's bitterness towards fathers and father figures, but our primary concern here is theological. How did Muhammad's childhood experiences affect his theology? In 7th century Arabia, the alternative to polytheism was not atheism. Atheism wasn't an option back then. The alternative to polytheism was monotheism. Since Muhammad had an overwhelming compulsion to rebel against his polytheistic culture, 
he initially aligned himself with the Jews and Christians, with their God, with their books, and with their prophets. This was the ultimate slap in the face to his tribe and his culture. Given his psychological profile, this is exactly what we would expect him to do. But there's a problem here. Both Jews and Christians view God as our Heavenly Father. God is a kind of divine father figure in Judaism and Christianity. In the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 32.6, we read, Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? The prophet Isaiah agrees. In Isaiah 63.16, he says to God, But you are our father, though Abraham does not know us, or Israel acknowledge us. You, Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer, from of old is your name. Now, even though Muhammad is rebelling against his own culture by aligning himself with Jews and Christians, would we expect him to accept the Judeo-Christian concept of God as Heavenly Father? Of course not. Childhood trauma hardwired him to be hostile towards father figures. And what do we find in the Quran? We find Allah mocking Jews and Christians for claiming that God is their heavenly Father. Surah 5, verse 18. And both the Jews and the Christians say, We are the children of Allah and his loved ones. Say, Why then does he punish you for your sins? Nay, you are but human beings of those he has created. Notice that According to the Quran, a father never punishes his children. Jews and Christians call God Father, and Allah responds with, If you're my children, why do I punish you for your sins? The author of the Quran has no concept of what a father is. Dad, I just flunked out of school. Well, son, I certainly won't punish you, because as everyone knows, fathers never punish their children. Plus, I burned the school down. No punishment for my son. But hundreds of students were burned to death. Not a problem, son. Real dads never punish their children, according to Allah, in the Quran. I've often wondered why Muslim teens don't bring up this verse when they get in trouble. Abdullah, I caught you eating ham and drinking beer at noon during Ramadan. What do you have to say for yourself? Too bad you can't punish me, Dad. If you do, you'll be calling Allah a liar, because Allah says fathers never punish their children. We can contrast this view with both the Old and New Testaments, which clearly state that God does punish his children. Deuteronomy 8.5 Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Proverbs 3.12, the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Hebrews 12.6, the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So the Quran doesn't just reject the Judeo-Christian concept of God as a heavenly father, it also rejects the idea that fathers discipline their children. Fathers just aren't involved in their children's lives in that way. Again, think about Muhammad's life. His father wasn't around. Then he was with a foster family. Then he was with his mother. Then he was with his grandfather. Then his uncle. They had their own families to care for. Who's around to show Muhammad what a father is? No one. So Muhammad ends up thinking of fatherhood in a purely biological sense, not in a relational sense. This is why Allah exclaims in Surah 6, verse 101, He, Allah, is the originator of the heavens and the earth. How can he have children when he has no wife? How can you be children of God when God doesn't even have a wife? Now, obviously, when we call ourselves children of God, we don't mean that God had sex and produced an offspring. When we say that Jesus is the Son of God, we don't mean that God had sex and produced Jesus as an offspring. But according to Muhammad, 
biological reproduction is the only thing anyone can possibly mean by calling God Father. Why? Because a father for Muhammad is someone who has sex with a woman, gets her pregnant, and then disappears. There is no child-to-father relationship with Allah. But in the course of denying the fatherhood of God, Allah explains the kind of relationship we can have with him. Surah 19, verses 88 to 93. And they say, The most beneficent Allah has begotten a son. Indeed, you have brought forth a terrible evil thing, whereby the heavens are almost torn, and the earth is split asunder, and the mountains fall in ruins, that they ascribe a son to the most beneficent. But it is not suitable for the most beneficent that he should beget a son. There is none in the heavens and the earth, but comes unto the most beneficent as a slave. We can only approach Allah as his slaves, never as his children. Does our view of God make a difference? Yes, it does. Since Allah doesn't think of us as his children, he doesn't have the kind of love for us that a father has for his children. A child doesn't have to earn his father's love. The father loves the child before the child does anything. This is why the Bible says we love because he, God, first loved us. God loved us first, and now we love. In Islam, we're all slaves, and if slaves want to be loved by their masters, they have to earn the love of their masters. Not surprisingly, the Quran repeatedly warns us that Allah won't love us if we're bad slaves. Allah does not love those who exceed the limits, Surah 2, verse 190. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner, Surah 2, verse 276. Allah does not love the unbelievers, Surah 3, verse 32. Allah does not love the unjust, Surah 3, verse 57. Allah does not love him who is proud, boastful, Surah 4, verse 36. Allah does not love the extravagant, Surah 7, verse 31. Allah does not love the treacherous, Surah 8, verse 58. Allah does not love the mischief makers, Surah 28, verse 77. Allah does not love any arrogant boaster, Surah 57, verse 23. So you have to submit to Allah as an obedient slave first, then he may love you. This is the sort of love Jesus condemns in Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48, where he says to the crowd, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Notice that the concept of love here is tied to the Christian concept of God. Muslims have a different concept of God and therefore a different concept of love. But Christians also believe that there's an eternal Father relationship within the nature of God. The doctrine of the Trinity claims that God exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Given Muhammad's psychological framework, how would we expect him to respond? Surah 9, verse 30, And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah, and the Christians say, The Messiah is the son of Allah. That is a saying from their mouths. They imitate the saying of the disbelievers of old, Allah's curse be on them, how they are deluded away from the truth. Surah 9, verse 30, of course, comes right after Surah 9, verse 29, where Allah commands Muslims to violently subjugate Jews and Christians. What's the justification for violently subjugating Christians? Surah 9, verse 30, Christians claim that Jesus is the Son of God. 
Muhammad was so maniacally opposed to a father-son relationship within the nature of God that he commands his followers to wage jihad against people who claim that Jesus is the Son of God. We can see now that Muhammad's obsession with attacking the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ had nothing to do with maintaining purity of worship or belief. If he had been at all concerned with purity of worship, he wouldn't have had his followers bowing down to a pagan shrine or kissing a black pagan rock. Muhammad's violent fixation sprang from his psychological hostility towards father figures. What's also interesting is that Muhammad's obsession with destroying any concept of God that includes the fatherhood of God has been imprinted on the Muslim community so that there's now a global community of people who are obsessed with destroying any concept of God that includes the fatherhood of God. And this obsession with attacking a concept of God because it includes the fatherhood of God or an eternal father-son relationship within the nature of God has always seemed odd to me. I grew up as an atheist. I was 20 years old when I first believed in God. At that point, I didn't have many preconceived notions about what God had to be like. It never occurred to me that I was in a position to tell God what he had to be like. God is whatever he is, whether I like it or not, and he was that way long before I was born. The best I can do is let God tell me what he's like. And here the question becomes, who are we going to listen to? Lots of people claim to speak for God, but they give conflicting descriptions So they can't all be right. Who's telling the truth? I don't know about you, but I'm going to listen to the guy who rose from the dead. Jesus repeatedly made claims that only God can truly make, and yet he prayed to the Father and told his followers to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus' claims only make sense in light of the doctrine of the Trinity. So I don't begin with a concept of God that I like and then stubbornly cling to it. I let the one who rose from the dead tell me what God is like. I find that many people have a different approach. They decide beforehand what they want to believe about God, and then they attack any concept of God that isn't what they already want to believe. In Islam, things are even worse. Many Muslims absorb Muhammad's hostility towards the Christian concept of God and Muhammad's misunderstanding of the Christian concept of God until this viral hostility and misunderstanding infect every conversation. Hi, Abdullah. I've been wondering, why do you believe that the Quran has been perfectly preserved when your most trusted sources talk about entire chapters coming up missing, large passages coming up missing, verses being eaten by a sheep, and who cares about that? Explain the doctrine of the Trinity. Wait, what? I thought we were talking about the Quran. If Jesus is God, why did he pray? Well, Jesus is the incarnate Son. As the divine Son, he has an eternal relationship with the Father. That relationship continued after the incarnation. So the Son talking to the Father makes perfect sense given Christian theology. But why did you bring this up when we were discussing the Quran? If Jesus is God, how can he die? Again, he's the incarnate son. He took on human nature at the incarnation. Since he took on human nature, he could die. Once more, you seem completely ignorant of basic Christian theology. Now, as for the Quran, how can you believe that God ate food? I feel like I'm going to keep giving you an answer and you're never going to listen. So you believe that God went to the bathroom? Did you miss the whole incarnation and trinity part? Because if you miss that, you're not going to get the rest. So you believe that God came out of a woman. God touched a woman's vagina. Are you listening at all, Abdullah? Why did Jesus say, the Father is greater than I? You mean, why did he say that after the incarnation, when, according to Philippians 2, he lowered himself and took on human nature? Is Jesus God or the Son of God? Oh my goodness, which part of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So Christians believe that one plus one plus one equals one. Christians can't do math, 
but Muslims invented algebra. Quick question. Why do you believe that Muslims invented algebra when the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Chinese, and the Indians all did algebra long before the birth of Muhammad? Who cares about that? Explain the doctrine of the Trinity. Wait, what? You just made a false claim about algebra. If Jesus is God, why did he pray? Abdullah, you have all of these factually false beliefs. They're beliefs that we can know are false by doing five minutes of research. And yet, every time we start to examine one of your factually false beliefs, you change the subject and start complaining about Christian theology. Of course I'm going to complain about Christian theology. Christians think that one plus one plus one equals one. Christians can't do math. But Muslims invented algebra. Abdullah, if you had any concern for truth or reality, you'd be ready to examine your many obviously false beliefs instead of changing the subject. The fact that you don't care that you have obviously false beliefs, but you constantly return to attacking Christian theology while making no attempt to accurately understand what you're attacking, leads me to conclude that your attacks come not from a desire for truth, but from a hostility towards the view of God as our Heavenly Father. And as your therapist, I find that interesting. So we set out to test our second prediction, namely that even though Muhammad rebelled against his own culture by aligning himself with the Jews and Christians, he would ultimately have to part ways with Judeo-Christian theology because Jews and Christians view God as our Heavenly Father, and Christians believe in an eternal father-son relationship within the very nature of God. And here again, not only was our prediction confirmed, it was completely confirmed. Muhammad said that the heavens almost rip apart and the earth splits in two at the claim that God is a father. The highest relationship anyone can have with God, according to Muhammad, is a slave to master relationship. Anyone who claims otherwise must be violently subjugated in the name of the God who only loves the slaves who first prove themselves worthy of his love by loving him first. Muhammad's irrational distrust of father figures was transmitted to his followers and has led not only to countless Muslims having theologically one-track minds, but to endless violence against Jews and Christians for our beliefs about God. Of course, given Muhammad's psychological profile, we wouldn't just expect him to rebel against tradition and authority, as we've seen he did, and we wouldn't just expect him to exhibit an unhinged hostility towards the Judeo-Christian concept of God, as we've seen he did. We said that we would also expect him to have some difficulty forming normal relationships with other people. In The Psychology of Islam, Part 4, The Lonely Prophet, we'll test our prediction that Muhammad's childhood experiences would lead to dysfunctional relationships as an adult. For you Muslims who are already wondering what could possibly be dysfunctional about an old man who claims to be a prophet forcing his best friend to hand over his six-year-old daughter in marriage, have I got a video for you.